Peter, the name Peter means rock. And so it is going to have tremendous strength. Now that was an unusual name as well. People were not named inanimate objects. Simon is, he's named rock. The other name is usually linked to a family member, a family history. This links to a rock, right, Peter. And so right then and there, Jesus makes it very clear that he is building his church on Peter. Now there's quite a responsibility for you. Does Peter get it? I don't know. I think that's a good question. I mean, at the fire, I don't know if he gets it. Pentecost Sunday, he gets it. He gets it. When the Holy Spirit comes, okay, and explains, opens up everything to them, they get it. Now, it doesn't say in sacred scripture, well, Peter went away scratching his head saying, what was that all about? No, but we see again the fact that the set the, the scene is set for us, the charcoal fire, the gathered around the fire, the conversation, you know, the three to the three uh, love comments versus the three denials. We see that the whole thing is set. But at the very end of that, he lets Peter know that Peter is totally forgiven for what he did, forgiven to such a point that now he is the base for Jesus's church. He's the one that's going to be the, the rock solid that the church is going to be built on. After all of that turmoil, and we would think like, how could Jesus, that really? I mean, he picks this guy, but he does. He does. Because he realizes the human frailties. He realizes that we stumble and we get up and we stumble and we get up. That's our human nature. And he sees that in Peter. That's his human nature. Peter acted out of fear, petrified, whatever you want to call it. And Jesus understands that. But when he checks in again at the second charcoal fire, yeah, well, it's heart to heart that are talking. It's heart to heart that are talking. And Peter's heart responds the way it should. And so Jesus does what he does, as I said before, what he does with all of us. He meets us where we are at, at any given time. There's no prideful uh, stance that Jesus takes. He meets us wherever we're at. All we have to do is turn toward him and he's right there. So let's take a look at some vocabulary before we move on here. We have Cleopas. He's one of the followers of Jesus who met him on the road to Emmaus. Now Emmaus is a small village. I was there a few years ago. As a matter of fact, Father Dave and I celebrated mass. I was his deacon at the mass at Emmaus at this um, it was a stone ruins. It wasn't a church church. There was no fancy, there were no lights. It was outside. It was a, it was a foundation, a stone foundation. But it's a small village away from Jerusalem. And after his resurrection, two of Jesus's followers, as scripture tells us, uh, meet him on the road to Emmaus. But the important thing here is that they did not recognize him until he decided they would. And he decided they would at the breaking of the bread. That's the key. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, we can't discount who he was. This is a very influential member of the Sanhedrin. And so he has to be very careful because the Sanhedrin can turn against him. So he has to be really careful. But he goes to Pilate, who hates all of them, and asks for the body of Jesus. And when given permission to take it down, he then um, lays the body of Jesus in his own tomb, a new tomb. Now, Mary Magdalene, she's one of the woman, women that followed Jesus. And she's the first person to have seen the risen Lord. And she sees him outside the tomb, walking through the garden. Now, reconciliation, it's still called penance, but it used to be the sacrament of penance when I was growing up. We didn't have the sacrament, we didn't call it reconciliation, but reconciliation is a better name for it because we are reconciling ourselves to God. And so the sacrament, this is the sacrament by which Christ's, Christ forgives sins. And he gave this to his apostles. And the important thing here is they passed it down to their successors to this day. They pass down the power 
the authority to forgive and retain sins in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And so that's handed down right from Jesus. And that's important because that's one of the things that we get challenged on all the time. Okay. Why do I, why, I can, I can talk to God. Yeah, well, so do I. I, yeah, I talk to God too. Yeah. But Jesus gave instructions. And so we are not at liberty to take out the instructions that we don't care for or don't understand. My rule of thumb is if you don't understand something in scripture, you need to seek somebody out to explain it to you. Because scripture is not a comic book. All right. It's not Spider-Man or you know, some other tale that we're reading. Scripture is the word of God written in the words of man. And so if there's something that we don't understand, we need to seek it out. Because in the New Testament, especially, Jesus is showing us how to live. And he's showing us the gifts that he gave us. He gave us the sacraments. The Last Supper, he gives us the gift of the Eucharist. The Eucharist, the source and summit of who we are. He gives us the gift of the Eucharist. So this is very key. So the resurrection, Jesus coming to life again on the third day. Hey, Michael, I have a question on the reconciliation. What argument do they use? Like when it's right there in scripture, it, and that's one that seems pretty clear, what argument do they give when you, when you take them back to that scripture passage? The argument they give is that when we confess our sins, we are confessing our sins to a man. They don't recognize the impersonal Christi. If we are confessing our sins to a man, we should be able to just confess them to God. That's the strongest argument that I've heard on this. And it takes some time to explain to them the concept of in persona Christi, mm -hmm. that the priest through the sacrament of holy orders, keep in mind, the Protestant traditions don't have sacraments. Yeah. Uh, I had the pleasure of bringing a Protestant minister into the church quite a few years ago. And when we got on the subject of sacraments, he referred to them as ordinances, which I had, I had not heard of that before, but that was his term for them. Well, we, not refer them to us they are sacraments okay these are gifts given to us by god for us to receive grace that's basically it mm -hmm. and so the sacrament of holy orders is extremely powerful the sacrament of holy orders puts an indelible mark on the soul just as baptism and confirmation do so you can't take an eraser out and erase it off one day you know as a deacon you can't say well i don't think i'm you know, I think I'll just scratch this out and thank you. It's been nice, but no, you know, no, it's there, you see. So with that sacrament of holy orders come, we call them faculties in today's language, uh, come some faculties. A deacon has his faculties. A priest has the faculties of a deacon plus his own faculties. A bishop has the faculties of a priest, the deacon plus his own faculties. And the Pope has them all, okay? So again, the faculties of a deacon, it's easy to explain by telling people what we don't do. We don't celebrate mass because we don't consecrate hosts. We don't uh, give absolution, so we don't hear confession. And we don't anoint because that usually involves the sacrament of reconciliation. We do everything else. That comes to us with holy orders. So the priest then has all of our faculties and his. He can celebrate mass and consecrate, he can anoint, and he can hear confessions and absolve sins. The bishop comes with all of those, and as I said, then the bishop can ordain, he can consecrate churches and cathedrals, and there's a whole list of things the bishop can do. And then when, when in doubt, uh, the Holy Father can do everything. You know? So in the Protestant tradition, no, they, they'll say, even, even the, con the conversation of prayer, why do we pray to the saints? Why don't we pray just to God? Well, yeah, we do, you know, but, you know, the, my explanation to that too is, well, I've heard this in Protestant circles, as well as Catholic circles, friends will ask friends to say a prayer for them. Well, the saints are our friends, so why can't we ask them to say a prayer for us? I don't, you know, but there's, a, the, there's this disconnect there, and the disconnect is simply that our non-Catholic brothers and sisters do not have a total grasp of Catholic theology. And our Catholic brothers and sisters do not have a grasp on Protestant theology. And therefore, in my opinion, they should not debate each other. They should respect each other and hopefully learn. 
But yes, the reconciliation, just like the, this is my body, just like this is my body. Uh, no, it's what to me, that's what it says. This is my body. But in Protestant circles, that's not the case, or it is the case for a time being. Uh, someone explained to me, and I forget the faith tradition at the time, but they said they believe it is the body and blood of Christ while they, they are distributing it. And then anything left over turns back to what it was before, and they can just toss it. Uh, that's not our belief at all. Uh, I've, during the pandemic, I was asked why we couldn't get those little cups that the Protestant churches use and put the precious blood in that. We would never do that because we would have hundreds of cups with precious blood possibly left in it, strewn all over the church. So no, we don't, that, that to us, that is the precious blood. It's not just wine or grape juice or whatever they use. It is the precious blood. So we would never do that. Uh, so uh, that's the differences in theology. But getting back to your other uh, situation. Now that the challenge is, why are we confessing our sins to a man? And we're not. When we go to the confessional, we believe that in the person of Christ, G, uh, the priest is there for us. And that Jesus has given him the power. He is forgiving our sins. The priest is forgiving our sins. But it's because Jesus gave him the power to do it. And that's what's in scripture. So to us, there's no doubt about that. He said it. This is what you do. But again, as the during the Reformation, the various denominations spun off because there were certain elements of sacred scripture or certain elements of Catholic belief that they chose not to believe anymore. And so they formed their own denominations um, by establishing what theologies they would have for their particular denomination. And I've said this, all, I say this all the time, we must remember the Catholic Church is not a denomination. It is the church. Everyone else is a denomination. They spun off from the church. So if you go back prior to the Reformation, we were all Catholic. Did we have people that were non-believers? Sure. All through time you had that. But the Catholic Church is the church with a capital C. Right? Is the church. All other denominations are denominations they spun off and for whatever reason i have to i have to claim ignorance there because i have not studied in any depth any other faith tradition than my own so i can only share what people from another faith tradition have told me but i'm not an expert in that the in catholic theology yes but not other theology it's only when i've entered conversations with other um, people from uh, non-catholic uh, uh, faith traditions that I've learned why they do certain things. And the minister that I brought into the faith, it was very enlightening for me as our faith was enlightening for him because he was explaining to me what, what their perception of certain things were in the faith. You know, so that's how we have to look at that. So I was, uh, yeah, thanks. I was recently at a Christian funeral, not Catholic. And the pastor said, oh, I asked her, you know, do, you know, we're all sinners. Did you ask? the Lord for forgiveness, you know, tell him your sins. And, you know, it just was missing, missing that piece that's spelled out there in the scripture that says, you know, whose sins you are forgiven. Like, why would he say that if, if he just wanted everybody to talk directly to him? You know, I, I agree. And as I said, that's why sometimes it does baffle me when people challenge very direct statements that Jesus makes, do yeah. this, don't do this, do that, don't do that. I don't, and I said the, the biggest one is this is my body. I don't, under, and I've gotten into many conversations with that. And I don't know, that, that's what it says to me. This is my body. He, he, he doesn't use any other words, no other adjectives, nothing. This is what this is. And so, okay, got it. You know, so, and and uh, people left that day because they couldn't handle it. You know, they, they left. So if, if it right. was just a symbol, it, yeah, it's not what you it says. And they that's how the people took it. That's correct. They were horrified by it because to them, they were, you know, they didn't understand what he was saying at all. And even today, believe it or not, that there are some, there are some denominations today that actually refer to us as cannibals, which I think is rather comical, sadly, in a way. But what Jesus is saying, you must take me in completely. You must take me in completely. That's what he's talking about. This is my body. This is my blood. Whoever eats this, whoever, you become what you eat. You see, but again, this has been misconstrued over the millennia 
as to what Catholics believe and don't believe. And you're right. He lost many of his disciples that day. And that's when he turned to the 12 and said, hey, you want to leave too? Notice his attitude. He doesn't say, hey, guys, let me explain this a little more. He just says, you want to leave? I think that's pretty powerful. And again, it's the way you read scripture. He doesn't say to them, hey, come here a minute. You know, don't leave me. Let me explain this to you. He just says flat out, do you want to leave too? But Peter has been enlightened by the father and says, no, you have the words of eternal life. And that's what Jesus says to him. My father told you this. I didn't tell you. You see, that's a powerful thing or a powerful element of that story that people miss. Because he didn't turn to them, just like when he appears to them in the upper room. He doesn't yell at them. Hey, where were you? I know I probably would have. I said, where? I would have said point blank, you know, thanks, guys. You know, you left me out there in the garden. You know, what a group of people you are. No, he doesn't do that. And the same thing when all the disciples leave him, he doesn't, he doesn't say like, oh, don't go, don't go, come here, come here, this is what I meant. He just says, hey, you want to go? Don't let the door hit you in the tail on the way out if you want to go. He's very, very emphatic about that. But again, they have been enlightened. Peter has been enlightened and says, no, 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 no. This is who you are. Where would we go? I love that. Where would we go? Uh, that's the answer. Where are we going? You're it. You know, where are we going to go? That's the beautiful answer that you get out of that. But unfortunately, as I said, many other denominations, we're not on the same page theologically there. And um, it's because of, well, their particular interpretation. And that happened. At, and, and again, some of the denominations are still splitting today, believe it or not. They're still splitting today because they still, they have some that want to believe this and some that want to believe that. I think I told you in a previous class that I was down in Florida one time doing a retreat for a group of Christian churches, Catholic included. And I had dinner with the Protestant minister who told me that after the retreat, he had an important meeting with his group because half the church, only half the church was believing in the divinity of Christ. The other half was not. And they were going to split. That was today, that's now. You know, so that still goes on. Those challenges are still out there. But the Catholic Church, no, that's why this Bible study, you know, it's very, very important that we um, continue unpacking sacred scripture. What are we unpacking? The words of God and the words of man. I mean, I sound like a broken record with that, but that's what we're doing. And that's what we need to do because we need to know how God is revealing himself to us. That's the key. All right. So, and the prayer thing, I get it all the time. Why do you pray to saints? You know, it's it's amazing. And it's funny when you give that explanation. Didn't you just ask me to pray for you? Yes, I did. Well, you know, why don't you pray to God yourself? Why would you ask me to go to him? Oh, yeah, right. You know, or why do Catholics pray to statues? We don't, we don't, we never have, we never will. Why are the statues there? The statues and the sacred art is there because it helps us to remember the good deeds that those people did in the hope that we can be like them. But no, you know, we're not praying to statues or to idols or whatever, but that, believe it or not, you get that today. That, you know, we, 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 we have idols in our churches. No, we don't. We have reminders of people who, and again, when you are reading the saints, get a good Lives of the Saints book. What's a good Lives of the Saints book? A good Lives of the Saints book is one that tells you the good and the bad. Okay, so you learn that, hey, they, were, they had a tough, tough go of it as well. You read St. Augustine. St. Augustine, you know, uh, lived quite the life before his conversion, you know, and you read of some of the other saints who, you know, they had tempers. They didn't get along with people at times, you know, they, you know, they had their rough days. What does that tell us? It tells us there's hope for us. That's the key. So when we remember the lives of the saints, yeah, we remember that even in their most difficult times, they still came through and that there is hope for us to do the same thing. And that's how we explain that, that we should not be tongue-tied with that. We should explain that very, very uh, uh, easily because as you read the lives of any of the saints, you will see that they, some, of the, uh, some of the nuns that were saints had arguments with their uh, their, their, their fellow sisters, if that's the right term. Um, I remember a story about uh, St. Padre Pio, who was angry with his sister for like 10 years or so, because she changed religious orders. 
this is a guy with the stigmata. And he was angry at something. I mean, you want to say, well, really? I mean, how does that happen? No, it just sure goes to show that we are human. And so we turn to the saints to remind us that there is hope for us that even those with the most difficult situations in life came through it and they are saints. So, and, and yes, we do pray for them. We do ask them to intercede for us. And I don't see anything wrong with that at all. I, I just don't see it. Anyway, um, looking at Thomas, as we've already talked about, one of the 12, not present when Jesus appeared to the rest of them. The big thing here is that he refused to believe that Jesus had risen unless he could see for himself. And that's the key. And we shouldn't fault him too hard because I think we would all fall into that category or a good number of us would as well. We want to see it. First, this is so bizarre, by the way. You buried the guy. You wrapped him in a shroud. You know, you packed the body with myrrh and, and fragrances and whatnot. You sealed the tomb. And guess what? He's sitting over here having a piece of fish. <laughs> you, know, you want me to believe this? Yeah, so we would be, I, I think that most of us would be just like him. But what happens? He becomes a very, very zealous, as they say, missionary and travels to India. And there are tremendous, when Father Anthony returns, we should get him to talk to us about the devotion to St. Thomas in India. Okay, a very, tremendous devotions to, to him. Any questions on what we talked about here? Okay, let's talk about now Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament. And we've said from the beginning of our Bible study that the, you have to read the Old Testament with the lens of the New Testament and vice versa. In other words, what is, what is prophesied in the Old Testament is going to be fulfilled in the New Testament. And when you see the things that Jesus has done in the New Testament, you're going to see that they were prophesied in the Old Testament. So although we have we call them two books, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're really one. And you have to read them through the through the specific lens. Okay. And so again, we have, you know, scripture tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. With his stripes we are healed. Right there tells you. Jesus gave his life for us. And because of what he went through, we are healed. And it says flat out, it declares exactly, uh, Isaiah declares exactly what has happened here. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He picked up all of the things that we did wrong okay on his own and redeemed us for it now i don't recall if any of you uh dan if you were there or if deacon mark was there at the retreat we had we had a priest come and he was talking about um the shepherd leading the sheep and he gave this big you know explanation and uh, my phone went off at the end of his presentation and it was a headline from the news that said that 1,000 sheep had gone astray because the shepherd had fallen asleep. Well, we were hysterical on the retreat. And I showed it to the retreat master right away because it was perfect. He had just finished this beautiful presentation for us on, you know, the importance of being, you know, a good shepherd and watching the sheep. And it happened so obviously somewhere in some place like Peru or whatever. But for whatever reason, it made the national news. And my phone got off with this hotline. And that was the headline. A thousand sheep have gone astray because the shepherd fell asleep, you know, at the wheel. So I thought that was, that was kind of funny. But again, going on with the scripture of Isaiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. That's a lot of, a lot of conversation comes out about that with the trial of Christ, where he didn't say a word in his defense. He didn't have to. Again, you have to understand the law. He didn't have to. They had to prove him guilty. He didn't do anything. Even in a court of law today, right? You don't have, if you are the defendant, you don't have to say a word. They have to prove their case. That's exactly what that is. However, in sacred scripture, when the high priests ask Jesus and he says, 
I adjure you, and he uses that odd little word, adjure, A-D-J-U-R-E. When he inserts that word, Jesus has to answer. That's why he does. Are you the Christ? And Jesus gives this long answer. It's only because he asks it directly. But Jesus doesn't have to say a word during that trial. They have to prove their case against him. And then it goes on to say, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken by the transgressions of, transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And the scripture finishes with, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors, as we were just talking about. He interceded for us. The death of Christ, all right, paid the debt that we could not pay. It's that simple. And that's a quote from Scott Hahn, not from me, but he, again, paid a debt that we could not pay. So most Christians will hear this <clears throat> as a summary of what the church believes about Jesus. And some might then be surprised to learn that it was written hundreds of years before the time of Christ. That's when that prophecy was written. It's in the Old Testament. It's chapter 53 of Isaiah. So that's why I say you have to read the Old Testament looking through that lens because it's going to be fulfilled in the new. And so as Jesus fulfills it, you can flip back then and find it in Isaiah 53. That's the beauty of the Old and the New Testament. So fulfilling the law and the prophets, as we look at that, <clears throat> as I just said, the Old Testament can't be understood without the New Testament. It just can't. It becomes a bizarre book that there's a lot of things going on, a lot of prophecies being ma made, but to what purpose? You say. So what does Jesus do? Jesus lifts the veil from the Old Testament so we can really see its full meaning. That's why we have to study it this way. He takes the blinders off and says, okay, let me show you where this is, you see. So the promises of the five Old Testament covenants are perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. They're perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. So when Jesus said that he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets, that's in Matthew 5, 17, most of the hearers, most of the people that heard him, thought of the long-anticipated restoration of the Davidic kingdom. What were they looking for? They were looking for a military messiah, someone to march in with an army, crush the Romans, and bring everything back to the golden years, bring everything back to the years of David, you see. Only later did the disciples understand how the scriptures, um, or understand that the scriptures prepared them to understand the real truth about Jesus, who he was, the real truth, that he would fulfill all of the promises in the scriptures, but he fulfills them by suffering and by dying, just as Isaiah had promised. That's the key, you see. So in Luke 18, 31 to 34, he says, it says, and taking the 12, no, 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 important point here. When he says the 12 and not the disciples, he's focusing obviously on the 12. When he's talking about the disciples, that could be thousands of people. We have no idea. A disciple is someone who is a student of the teacher. So when scripture switches into that language and taking the 12, all right, that means he's focusing on just those 12 guys. That's important when it switches that way. So taking the 12, he said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets. He tells them, everything that's written by the prophets will be accomplished. It's referring to Isaiah. Everything written in Isaiah is going to happen. All right? For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him and on the third day, he will rise. That's the prophecy we just read. But here's the rest of it. But they understood none of these things. Not a clue. 
understood none. Okay, this saying was hidden from them. They did not grasp what was said. So as he was telling them, they just did not it did not compute. Okay, just didn't compute. So although Jesus did everything he could to prepare them for what was to come, they really understood it all in hindsight. Later on, it comes to them, not as he's teaching them. Okay, he's giving them the words. It's going in, but it's not really unpacking. They're not really getting it, you see. But once they did understand, wow, what happened then? Well, they could see how perfectly Jesus then fulfilled all the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's what happens at Emmaus. What not a, wasn't our hearts burning? Were not our hearts burning? Yeah. All of a sudden, he's unpacking this for them, and they're beginning to put the links together. And they got it. And they're on fire now, you see. So again, uh, he explains how all this is fulfilled. And when the, um, when the apostles preached to the Jewish audiences, their theme was all, always the same theme. How all the things the scriptures had taught them to expect were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Every one of the writers, that's what they're communicating to their audience is that every single thing that the prophets had taught were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's the job that they had, to go out and to preach that. Okay? And again, we look at St. Paul in the, in the book of Acts 13, 32 to 33. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, in raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. So they're out preaching this. They're preaching the good news. Okay. So just as he did for his disciples, Jesus lifts the veil from the Old Testament for us by making available these types of studies. So that veil can be, those, you know, those uh, scales can be uh, taken from our eyes so we can see exactly what is going on here so that veil gets removed so that we can understand the full meaning of what we only partly understood before keep in mind when we preach on sunday you get eight minutes 10 minutes on a good day you can't unpack all jesus did in that period of time and so it's important for us as catholic christians as all christians to really study sacred scriptures because we only partly understood them before. Depending on the level of theology you have had, you might have a very light understanding of what went on in, in sacred scripture. And the deeper you study, well, all of a sudden, you know, the light starts to break through and you start to see deeper meanings. And, you, and the words of scripture begin to speak to you, particularly, you see. So it's really very important. Now, Moses wore a veil after he came down from Sinai because the people were afraid to look at his glowing face. And St. Paul tells us that those who read the Old Testament without the new are still blocked from seeing what Moses really meant. Now, keep in mind, there was no New Testament in Paul's time. That's just a, an explain. What he's saying is that when you read the Old Testament without knowing what Jesus did in the new, so we didn't have the New Testament until it started around the year 60. All right, except Paul was writing in the mid to late 40s, but we don't have the New Testament as we know it now. So what he's referring to when he talks like that is he was, he's, he's referring to the fact that we can't read the Old Testament without linking it to Jesus. All right. And if, if, we, if we try to do that, we're still blocking what Moses really meant. Okay. So to this day, whenever Moses is read, all right, a veil lies over people's minds. How do you remove it? You have to turn to Jesus. You have to turn to what is revealed to us in the New Testament to remove the veil. The Old Testament's a difficult read. You have a lot of wars, a lot of fighting, a lot of bloodshed, you know, a lot of what appears to us to be chaotic times. How do you understand that? You, the only way you understand it is to link it to Christ. If you don't link it to the New Testament, 
Yeah, you got this, you know, the, the Old Testament, as I, I think I've said this to you guys before, the Old Testament God is pictured as the angry God, mad at everybody and everything. And in the New Testament, he somehow or other takes a Dale Carnegie course and he loves everybody. Okay. Well, that's not really it. That's not really it. You have to read one through the other. So Jesus perfectly fulfills the promises of every one of the five covenants of the New Testament. And again, I believe you have this in your notes uh, with Adam, because Jesus restores our relation. If you don't have it in your notes, I apologize. I, I sent out outlines. It might be in your outline. We have it. We have it here. Okay. It's so, here. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, but let's review that. With Adam, because Jesus restores our relationship with God, that was broken by Adam's sin. That relationship, that covenant was broken by the sin. The second one is with Noah, because the waters no longer destroy, but they redeem us. They redeem us. That's why the waters of uh, uh, in the Noah story are viewed as the waters of baptism, bringing us to new life. The With Abraham, because through jesus abraham's descendant all people of the world are blessed all people big letters all people of the world are blessed not just some all people of the world are blessed with moses because the righteousness demanded by the law is given to us in jesus christ god gave moses the law and with david because jesus the son of david is the lord of all nations Okay, so let's look at, we got a little time left. Let's start to talk about the church before Jesus. So we, in, in, in Genesis, we see from the beginning, God had a plan to save us. We know that because I love that story where, you know, God walked in the cool of the evening and, you know, walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. And um, he calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? Well, Adam and Eve are hiding now because they've sinned. And this question has come up in the past where if God is all-knowing, why is he asking where he is? He knows where he is. Well, that's true. He does know where he is. He also knows what he did. But why is he calling out to Adam? That is the first call to salvation is what that is. Right from the beginning, God had a plan. And by calling out to Adam and to Eve, okay, God is going to reveal his plan to save us. That's why that's so important. Hey, Adam, where are you? It doesn't say, it should say, hey, Adam, I got something to tell you. You know, you know I know you did wrong, but come here. Let me tell you how we're going to fix this. All right. No, Adam, where are you? It's a call to salvation because right after that, God goes into the explanation of what he's going to do and how they're going to be saved. Yeah. So again, God told, tells his people, Adam and Eve, about the plan long before Jesus was born. Tells them right on the spot, right there. This is what the deal is. You see, so the early church fathers called Abraham, uh, David, and other faithful people Christians because they expected the coming of the Christ. So the word Christian doesn't come into our vocabulary until the early church fathers. That's why you don't find it in the Bible. And as I've said before, you don't find the word Bible in the Bible either. So when our friends challenge us, I don't see the word Trinity. Yeah, right. Okay, got it. It's there if you look for it, but the word isn't there because theological vocabulary begins to get developed during the period of the church fathers. And that's when we get the, this these different terms and these different titles. That's the key. So when people say to you, show me Trinity in the Bible, I can show you where it is visually. I can show it to you in Genesis because you have a dual conversation. God is talking as we. So he's talking with the word. He's talking with the son. And the how it, depending on the, on the, the Bible you have, the, um, the wind or the breeze or whatever that's circulating over the chaos, that's the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus getting baptized, right? And it tells us, you hear the voice of the Father, the Son is getting baptized, and the Holy Spirit is there in the form of a dove. Guess what? That's the Trinity, but it doesn't say Trinity. So a lot of this vocabulary, as I said, doesn't come in until the church fathers, and that's when Christian comes in. So 
uh, in our catechism, number 751, the church in the Latin word is ecclesia, uh, means church, okay? Means a convocation or an assembly, it's an assembly of people, that's an assembly. It designates the assemblies of all the people, usually for a religious purpose. All right, so that's where we that's where we get that. So, um, ecle uh, ecclesia is used frequently in the Greek Old Testament for the assembly of the chosen people before God. All right, so if you can check that reference out in your catechism in uh, 751 and read that. So, in fact, the history of the church really begins with creation. That's the history of the church. It really begins with creation. In the beginning, when God created us, in his image, okay, he meant for us to live happily with him forever. That was the plan. That was the game plan. Real easy, real simple. All right. When we disobeyed him, it didn't change the plan, but it did mean that we'd have to be that we would have to be saved from ourselves. That's why Jesus came. God still wants us to live happy, still wants us to live happy in him. That never changed. That always stayed the same. So because we disobey God, then we deserve the death of the body that comes in because of sin. Death is in the world because of sin. That's why. If Adam and Eve didn't sin, death would not be in the world. That's, that's that simple. So that's how we understand original sin coming into the world. But all of us, even the greatest saints, are sinners, and I mentioned that before. That's why I said, get when you get a Lives of the Saints book, get one that really tells you the full view of the saints' personality and the struggles and the difficulties that they that they went through. Uh, see, but God doesn't want a single one of us to be lost. That's the key here, and we have to remember that He doesn't want any of us to be lost. Although we deserve death, God was willing to pay any price to bring us back to him. That's the power of the plan that is revealed, revealed in, Gen in Genesis. He is willing to pay any price. So as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, as I just said a few minutes ago, what happened? He already had a plan, already had a plan to save us. And what was that plan? The plan was to send his only son to die in our place. That was the plan. So even in Old Testament times, the people of God knew about God's plan. Most of them didn't understand it very well. I think a lot of people don't understand it very well today. But the prophets had told them what would happen. All through the Old Testament, the prophets speak of a time when God's anointed one will come to save his people. That's the common thread all through the Old Testament. God's anointed one will come to save his people. And one reason that Christ's message spread so quickly was that the whole Jewish world was expecting the Messiah. They were looking to anyone, any boy that was born. Could this be it? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one? Okay. Every, every single Jewish family was waiting and looking for the Messiah. In fact, the early church fathers insisted that faithful people like Abraham and David and all the prophets could they said they could correctly be called Christians because they expected God's anointed one. And what's the word we use for the anointed one? Christ. So they expected Christ. So the church fathers said, yeah, they could be called Christians. What is a Christian? A follower of Christ. What is Christ? The anointed one. So you can ping pong ball that all the, all the way you want, but it all boils down to the same thing. The anointed one is, is Christ. That's the word that is used for the anointed one. And um, the, uh, the people that were waiting for the anointed one, the Christ, could be called followers of Christ, Christians. But it's the church fathers that bring that in. So Eusebius, who is a church historian, he says, all of these whose righteousness won them commendation going back from Abraham himself to the first man, might be described as Christians. In fact, if not in name, without going far from the truth, uh, they obviously are linked. And that's what he wants us to believe. They're, they're, they're linked. So we have to regard the religion proclaimed, he says, in recent years to all nations, 
through Christ's teaching as none other but the first, the most ancient, and the most primitive of all religions, discovered by Abraham and his followers, God's beloved. Why? They followed the Christ, the Christians. So he uses, Eusebius, the historian, links that and says, we have to call them all. We have no choice, because that was exactly the position of the Jewish people, looking for the Messiah, looking for the anointed one. Okay, now we as Catholic Christians, all Christians, okay, recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but the Jewish faith does not. They are still waiting for the Messiah. 